When I first came out of Petron, they, they wanted to grow. And um, so I went right to work making hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of calls um, to get to, you know, a wider audience across the nation. They weren't really aggressive, so to speak, with their last sales force to, to grow in that fashion. But the owners said to me, hey, look, you know, we want to do this. We got financial. We can buy new equipment. We can fit so many machines. So go to work. Just a quick reminder for you to like, subscribe, and rate this podcast so we can get your feedback and know how to make it better. Hey, it's Ari. Welcome to another episode of the Made in America podcast. I have Paul Thornburg, Vice President of Business Development from Petron Automation. Paul, thank you so much for coming on today. You're welcome. No problem. Well, listen, Paul, it's the Made in America podcast. So we always start off with the same two questions. What do you make and why do you make it? All right. What we make is we make custom parts, uh, precision. All right, let me start over. Precision machined parts or metal components uh, per customer specifications. Uh, we don't make a product per se. Mm -hmm. We make parts that go into other people's products and usually very high precision. We do very small parts and up to medium sized parts, high volume, um, mostly metal. And I'm going to ask you the double why. Why do you make it? Which is one, and I know you know you'll have to give us some history on the company, okay. uh, sort of why the company does what it does, and and why in the niche that they're in. Okay. Um, and let's go through that, and then I'll ask you some personal whys. Okay. Well, the cost, the company Petron Automation started in 1980. Uh, Michael Petro Sr., who's still there today, uh, started out as uh, kind of working out of his garage, just like a typical manufacturing story building machines to do secondary operations for eyelet companies uh, and automated screw machine companies. Uh, and he basically made machines that, you know, put drilled holes, put flats, whatever it had to do. Uh, and as the technology started to advance, that work started kind of fading away because the machines could do more and more. Um, so the company started buying up CNC Swiss machines a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time. And then in 2014, they expanded into another part of the building, built, a, uh, went up to 17,000 square feet, bought more equipment. Uh, we're running more high tech machines like Tornos machines for medical parts. And uh, it just blossomed up to where it is today, where we have about 26 employees, uh, 23 pieces of CNC equipment. And uh, we're doing business mostly for the medical industry and firearms industry. Where did the business start? And it started in medical? Watertown. No, it started in, like I said, from, I would say from a product standpoint, it was eyelet stampings. It could have been medical. It could have been for commercial. It could have been I'm not 100% mm -hmm. sure, but he was building machines basically that would automatically feed parts, do the operation, and just more or less spit them out. And as a matter of fact, today the mach we have like seven machines that are still there from the original start of the business doing the same parts for the same customer. No kidding. Yep. We're it, at what, a, 42 years later? 42 years later. I, well, I, about 38 for that. But, okay. it, but it, he, um, yeah, the, the, the business stays in there and it, it, it fluctuates a little bit with the customer's needs, but it's we're doing anywhere between five and 10 million parts a year in that little area and uh, still the same machines that he built all those years ago. They need, you know, they need repair and maintenance and everything, but um, still doing that work on top of all the work that we're doing, uh, hmm. other work we're doing, so. So that's interesting. So we've got some kind of more old school machines and it sounds like a big yep. investment and a lot of kind of new school yep. uh, equipment. I want to talk about that a little bit. So sure. anyway, I'm just interested in technology and I think it's so important in Connecticut manufacturing, both on and off the production floor. But before we sort of get into some of those details, Paul, how did you get into manufacturing? What, what, what brought you there? Kind of give us your backstory. Uh, my brother brought me into it and, uh, not, I don't hate him for it, but no, I'm just kidding. No, uh, I got into manufacturing through my brother, actually. Um, I was in the service, got out, kind of didn't know what I wanted to do. Uh, and I moved down to Florida for a little while and came back to Connecticut, not again, not knowing what I was going to do. And I was kind of floundering around. And my brother came to me and said, hey, would you like to come and try and work for me and try it out? And I was like, 
I don't even know what you do because I didn't. Uh, I knew he had a machine shop, but I had no idea what that was and as far as what they did and everything. So he said, well, you come on board, I'll teach you. And I did. I, you know, went in bottom of the barrel. He didn't cut me any slack, that's for sure. Uh, I was literally, you know, mopping the floor and cleaning the toilets and doing whatever it took. Um, but I took to it. He taught me how to read blueprints, do inspection, you know, handle the equipment. Then I started running machines and just got more and more involved. And I started doing some of the operational work and sales. And that's kind of where my, my niche started. Uh, was in sales, found that I was pretty good at it, and uh, I started my uh, schooling in industrial management and quality, and it just kind of blossomed from there and then just kept growing through the ranks, and uh, I stayed with that company for 17 years and just kind of things kind of fell to the, we had a little bit of a falling out as family businesses sort of do, um, but, you know, I progressed on and tried a lot of different companies and uh, I just progressed up to the point where I am and kind of had that at each company where my hands were kind of in a lot of different things. Um, and Petron, I've been there for two and a half years, and this is the first company I've been to uh, since leaving my brother's company. I felt that it's the, you know it's the right culture for me, it's the right atmosphere for me, and um, you know I, I just enjoy going to work every day and doing what we do. You know, it's frustrating sometimes, like anything else, but. Uh, but it is it is a good culture there, a great group of people, smart people, and uh, enjoy it a lot. And that's how I got where I am. There you go. Well, listen, much. anything anything worth doing is going to have some bad days. You just want to have a lot oh, yeah. more good days. Yeah, so, absolutely. No absolutely. doubt about it. Um, I, you know, something we haven't talked a lot about on the podcast, but I think it would be really interesting for the audience is maybe – you know, talking about somebody who's in the business development role, but what's really interesting, I think, about your background in particular is you've kind of done it all, right? I mean, quite literally from mopping the floors to running machines to production planning, blueprint reading, and some operational management, and now sort of in business development. So I guess I wonder, maybe you could share with the audience sort of your perspective on what do you need to do to be successful in developing business for, for manufacturing? What have you done that works, you know? Well, t I'd say patience and tenacity. I mean, you have to be, when it, when it comes to sales in any business, you have to be, you know, uh, persistent without being a pest. That's the way I call it. And, you know, you just make the calls, you, you more or less learn your business and what the best fits are for that business. Um, it's, it's rewarding also to, you know, I don't know how much you do in sales, but it is very rewarding to get those contracts and things. But again, I think that knowing the right fit for your company, what fits best, what like with us, what parts we are good at, what we wouldn't be good at, what were cost effective and things like that. So it's it's a you know, I think that it, being in a, in a sales position in manufacturing, especially in a machine shop atmosphere, you should know what you're selling. Uh, you should have your hands in the machines. You should have hands on. Uh, with quality and things to understand that when you look at a project that you're not uh, promising or selling more than you should be. You know what I mean? So to avoid selling products, you're going to lose. You don't want to. You're going to lose money on, or, yeah, or, not, yeah. or not be able to deliver on the quality or the right. delivery and timing. We don't. We don't. You don't want to oversell your yourself or the company and embarrass yourself or the company either because you're. You know, we're in a, a business where everything has to be. You know, made right, made on time, and you know. So you want to make sure you're 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 uh, covering all the bases, so to speak. Um, and at Petron, you know, we we specialize in some certain things. I'm not going to say we, I, I think we're the best out there because that's where I work. But um, there are I, out of all the different companies I've worked at, each one has its own little niche of what it's very good at and what it's you know sort of good at. And uh, we've we've proven ourselves to be, you know, uh, good at doing things that people don't want to do. Unfortunately, I had a part and I forgot to take it with me, um, but we're working on a medical project now. We actually just shipped the second lot of it today. And the part is so small that if you look at it next to a dime, uh, I have a picture on my phone. Actually, I'll show you later. Uh, it looks like basically a speck of dirt. It's just so small, but it has very intricate details and um the company that we made it for came to us with it and said, we can't find anybody that could do it. Would you guys want to take it on? We did it and we were successful at it. And now we're in the second phase in medical, they go through different phases. And once we hit the third phase, we'll go into production on it and it'll be a pretty good job for us, you know? 
Um, so it's, it's like I said, it's carving that niche and, and knowing what your uh, specialties are. You know what and I mean? then from there, what do you go out and sort of say, okay, well, I know what we, I know what we've, what our specialty is. I know where our niche is. Who's going to need that niche and sort of make your target list? Yeah. Yeah. I go through, uh, when I first came out at Petron, they, they wanted to grow. And um, so I went right to work making hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of calls um, to get to, you know, a wider audience across the nation. They weren't really aggressive, so to speak, with their last sales force to, to grow in that fashion. But the owners said to me, hey, look, you know, we want to do this. We got financial. We can buy new equipment. We can fit so many machines. So go to work. Um, I went to work. Things worked out good and I'm, I'm not going to say you know I don't I like to pat myself on the back as much as possible but <laughs> the market has bared very well for a lot of machine shops and if you're not busy at this period right now <laughs> and the last two years you're either in the wrong uh, niche so to speak or you're just struggling not, with your execution yeah exactly exactly so um, you know you don't be in business for 42 years uh, by doing the wrong things. So the company, you know, having that backing and everything and confidence in selling it and knowing that, hey, if I go out there and sell this, I know that we're going to be able to make good on it. And we do. So I'm not going to say it was easy, but it wasn't, you know, the, the, the atmosphere was very good the last couple of years. And it was a, a, a very nice that I got a lot of callbacks and a lot of interest. And but out of, you know, say 400 different companies, I called maybe four worked out. You that's know. the uh, that's the yeah, that's so, the persistence the tenacity that you right, were talking about right. before. But, it, but again, you get a lot of you do get a lot of feedback from people, but it's usually you know well this isn't the volume's not there or this part isn't for us or it's too big for us or whatever. And then you know I I kind of dial in my my sales method and say you know don't tell them we can do this. You know make sure you specify the maximum sizes and things like that. So it you know kind of molded after uh, after time of what. I knew not what not to sell and what to sell. So yeah, that probably makes a big difference. Yeah, yeah. And what's kind of the process? Do you have support internally? Do you know enough that you can kind of take the whole thing through like the quoting process? Or are you just sort of bird dogging it? And then no, we we work as a team, and and it's uh like I said, we're in many different hats in a company. And business development is just kind of what my title is when I came in, you know. And uh, but because of my experience with operations and everything, we we do one thing we do well is a is an as, initial risk management management or risk assessment I'm sorry of each job coming in the door so mm -hmm. when I get a when I when it comes in I'll see the first blueprint the initial and I'll do an initial read through of the drawing look at the dimensions the tolerancing you know what are the red flags so to speak of these jobs because you know I, I don't I can't say I speak for everybody but with our business when we are getting drawings there's so many different things from say 20 years ago to gd and t and engineering mm -hmm. all this stuff that you have to take into account that it may say one thing on the drawing for a tolerance but then they want you know all these quality requirements different cpk levels and this and that where you have to shrink the tolerance and it makes it that much harder, harder. To sometimes the engineers don't understand that and the, but you know usually the quality people you're dealing with understand it uh, uh, at the customers um, sometimes and the buyers don't understand, well, why is the price so high? Well, you know, we have to check these 100% or whatever. So we, we, we do initial risk assessments and then we release it to the team. We do our quality manager, operations manager, our CNC manager, and our plant manager. We all look at everything and do, you know, again, an initial risk assessment. Do we want to even look at this job? Is it going to fit our shop? Um, what's going to be the, the, bottlenecks that we can be caused on these jobs so we do a good risk assessment and then we you know we just kind of go through the motions and I'll do all the legwork for getting all the quotes for like outside services uh, raw materials mm -hmm. things to that nature and anything for CNC the machining part of it our CNC manager does a full write-up with all the tooling and times and setup times and everything like that and then we put it into our system it spits out an estimate and then we go over it with uh you know the the upper management and say okay this look like good price to you and <laughs> they put their stamp on it and <laughs> and out we go yeah and away we go so it's it's uh and it, you know it, we're any machine shop that's higher than like 20 percent 
on getting their jobs. They're probably not charging enough money, <laughs> um, but we, we normally operate at about a 5% success rate. And, uh, you know, with how much, qu how many quotes we do, uh, compared to what we actually get. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a exercise, you, but it's not futile. You futile. Know? Yeah. Yeah. Are you, so are you out, um, developing and maintaining existing relationships or yeah. mainly focused on new? Like no, new no, no. I, I take care of a lot of the customer service aspects of it, so to speak, but I'm also out on the floor doing, you know, helping with operations, production planning, um, when you're in a small business like that, you know, we got 26 people, you're wearing a lot of different hats mm -hmm. and, um, I'll do purchasing. I'm doing actually most of the purchasing right now. It's like requisitions will come in or it'll say, Hey, I need this, go find it and buy it. Uh, but we have Joe, our, our shop manager, he does all the purchasing of raw materials. I get all the quotes. He does all the buying of it so he can track it through the jobs and things. So everybody's doing a lot of different things. And I mean, if they, you know, we have a part that needs to be deburred, they put it on my desk. I don't, nobody can do this. Can you do it? Yeah. So I'll go out in the shop. And it's kind of tedious in our shop because we got to do it under a microscope <laughs> or scrapers. But, but uh, no, we'll, we do whatever it takes to get the work out the door. I mean, that's, that's the that's bottom line. That's how it goes. And, you know, the business development was an initial title that we, we agreed upon. Um, but I, I really don't think it's uh, uh, consistent with what I do on a daily basis. Yeah, it sounds like you got your fingers in a lot more yeah, stuff. Yeah, it's than a lot of different that. things going on in sales. You know, as important as it is, it's more important to uh, when we where we are right now is to maintain our our um, relationships with our customers and grow with them. As you know, new business is still there. We're still I'm still making cold calls and things like that. But it's just not, I don't have to be as aggressive as I was, you know, when we first, when start, first, when I first started. started yeah, so. so I want to circle back to the technology and, and I'm going to ask you about culture because you did mention earlier that you mm -hmm. finally found a culture fit. So I'm in, interested to hear about that. But you, you talked also about sort of the advancement of technology at uh, Patron over time or Petron over time. Mm -hmm. um, and I know you haven't been there that long, but sounds yeah. like you have a pretty good grasp on the history. And I just maybe you could share some thoughts about, you know, A, you know, how that technology did advance, like what sort of spurred that on. Sure. Um, and uh, yeah, they got a follow up to that, but let's start there. Well, the CNC technology and it, it kind of, you know, it's been around for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, they had the tape machines. They had the, you know, the, the programming only at the machine. And as computers, you know, started, I'm not a big computer guy, but, you know, as everything evolved, the machines got more and more smart, so mm -hmm. to speak. And uh, Today, like that, our telephones. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> exactly. And it, I mean, you could use your telephone to do check machines now, you know, to make sure they're running and things like that. But, you know, the, the technology, the machines, the machine itself is doing the same thing. It's taking cutters and cutting metal into shapes based on the program you put in. Of course, you know, the, the as the technology grew, well, so did the complexity of the parts that <laughs> we're making and also the quality of the parts. And that's kind of, you know, it's been beneficial because you look at cars today, how much longer they last, how much better they are. Um, so the machines are the same way. They're constantly, constantly advancing to do new things. Um, and and some of the things these guys can make the machines do, you're just like, wow, you know, I can't believe that it's doing that, you know. And there's a lot of science to it too, though, with the, you know, the, the cutting cutter cutters, uh, inserts and drills and end mills and things like that. That's also advanced, so you're getting a lot more life out of them. And you know what materials will cut stainless steel? What materials will cut this better? So there's a lot more to it, you know. And I, I'm not a fully understanding of all that. I know a little bit, but these guys, like I said, they're they're you know that's why they tell me what to buy. <laughs> but um, no, but the technology is going to continue to keep advancing. Um, and I think that with why is it so critical? Do you think, or or would you think that the the team at Petron has believed that it's been so important to invest in these newer technologies and go through the pain of learning them and all that? Well, it's like anything else. If you don't, you're going to get left behind. Um, there, there's, you know, like I said, where, when he first started a company, there was a huge need for these secondary machines, and there is still a need for them in certain areas, um, but you're not going to open up a secondary shop these days and, you know, think that you might get like, well, we got, we got a long-term contract on it. So there's no reason to get rid of it 
because it's profitable. It's, you know, we're, we're doing a, a, a good service for the company that we're doing it for, and it just keeps going and going and going. So will it come to an end? Maybe. I don't know. I hope not. But um, as far as I go, but, but like I said, that technology of, you know, guys that are turning the handles on bridge ports and lays and stuff, there's still a need for that. There's still a lot of eyelet tool makers. And, you know, I want to say old school tool making that needs mm -hmm. to be done. But even the technology of a Bridgeport machine, now it's, you know, they put prototracks on mm -hmm. there so you can, you know, make it a little more automated so you're not going like this all the time. <laughs> but um, but I, I think that the, 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 the technology, as far as the technology is gone, that the younger people coming in, into the industry should still learn how to turn the handles. And it's like a calculator, you know, you should know how to do the math before you use the calculator. Mm -hmm. you know, it's like back when... I guess, I don't maybe I'm a little older than you, but when we use calculators, it was like, wow, look at this thing. It can add up and it can do this. But, you know, it's the same thing. You you should learn how to do it manually before you Understand how the machine's yeah, doing the, the thing. The computer part of it is, is very important because you need to know how to program a machine. But if you don't know what the machine is doing, then... It makes it even a little bit harder. Exactly, exactly. What, you had said something earlier about why, you know, if you're in a machine shop today, you should be doing well. I mean, that's a shorthand of what you said, but, you know, that you know, with some exceptions. And I wonder, in your experience, especially being out in the market, talking to customers, what do you think's driving that growth? Right now, you know, depending on the market you're in if you you know you go back 2020 if you were in aerospace say you notice the market went because not no one was flying they weren't yeah. building airplanes yeah we've heard that before right and and if you, you know you look in the defense sector you know with the f-35 say that whoever's hands were in, are involved in that they're going to be in that for a long time and they're going to be busy Petron was has been very busy over the last two years because we're our main things are medical and firearms. Well, the last two years, three years, say, what have been the biggest drivers? Medical because of the COVID and you know ventilator. We make parts for ventilators. You've you know, been busy. We used to make ten thousand pieces a year for this one company for a ventilator part, and next thing you know, they want a hundred thousand like that. You know, so. It, it 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 goes with anything else. There, you know, there's a definitely a curve there, and um, you know, but it seems like all the onshoring too now with the supply chain issues and things like that. That machine shops are very busy. Maybe they're. It seems like they're more busy because they can't find help. I don't know, um, but. I think that the market. Have you been feeling that the onshoring? You, do you see that in some of the orders? And I, I see a lot. We see a lot of quotes coming back that would be you know, we lost because we couldn't be competitive with offshore and then they'll come back and they're like, well, your price is too high. It's like, well, you know, this is what our price is. Um, so we are seeing some stuff that you would normally not see in a screw machine shop, you know, like dowel pins and things like that, that are, you wouldn't consider they're not easy by no means, but they're, you know, they're really overseas could kill us on the prices. You know what I mean? So, but people have a need, they need it and they need it now for their product so they're they're you know willing to pay a little bit more just to get their product out the door but it's also part of the inflation you're going to see that too is that you know we're, we're seeing increases of raw material forget it. it's doubled tripled in some cases tooling everything has gone up so you know we have to raise our shop rates now and everything like that but if you know i say that kind of like because i know a lot of people in the business i know a lot of shops and everybody i know is pretty much super, super busy. Um, and if they're not busy, they either don't have a good sales force or they're just not that good. That's the way I see it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's my opinion. I don't want to get into it. That's fair enough. Ruffle, hey, man, you're, I don't here, ruffle anybody's you're, here, feathers, to share, you're here to share yeah, your yeah. opinions, Paul. Drive it, baby. I don't ruffle anybody's feathers. <laughs> I'm just saying it just seems right now that everybody I know that's in manufacturing from, let's say, tier two or tier three companies, they're just flat out. Mm -hmm. Platers and you know machine shops. I saw my brother owns a welding company. He's just you know he's very busy. You know sheet metal and welding and and it's a it's a good time. I mean it's a Gotta good time. Got to make hay when the sun yeah, is exactly, shining. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. I've seen the bad times and um, uh, you know I've been through some really good times. But this is this has been I don't want to say it's unusual, 
but it's just it's it's been great. It's been a good thing. It's it's uh it's better than struggling. That's for sure. well. There's no doubt about that. <laughs> Let's talk a little about the culture, Paul. You know, you mentioned you've been to a number of shops, worked in mm-hmm. one place for 17 years, and then I think yeah. you're at you know four or five shops in between before you found your your kind of current home. Mm-hmm. What is it about the culture uh, at Petron that really connected with you? Well, the biggest thing is the. Uh, owners and upper managers, which are basically one in the same as a small company, um, they're very open to ideas. Uh, they're letting people do what they were hired to do, uh, not squashing ideas, not, um, you know, this is how it is and that's it. And if you don't like it too bad kind of thing, you know, not to say that uh, I've been to too many companies that were like that, but there were some, you know, definitely, uh, companies that I've worked for that were not open to free ideas like that. And, you know, my theory is that if you hired me to do a job, let me do my job. If I'm not doing it good, then just tell me. But if I'm doing it okay and I'm doing good and everything like that, you know, let me keep doing that. And, um, you know, like I said, that that's part, a big part of the culture, but the culture at Petron also is the same thing. Everybody comes in, they work hard, they do their job. And they go home feeling good that they, you know, hey, hard days work, hard day pay, whatever. Um, there's not a lot of animosity. Uh, when I first got there, there was quite a few, uh, let's say, clicks, so to speak. Um, and, you know, they more or less worked themselves out. Mm-hmm. And uh, since then, we've, we've definitely had uh, a lot lower turnover. Uh, unfortunately, not a lot of new people coming in because the, the you know, gap in and experiences and stuff, but, uh, no, but, uh, you know, it, it's just a, it's a good place to work. You know, what are some of the things that you think that they do to sort of promote that listening and communication culture? I mean, there's lots of people, lots of employees out there that want that. Uh, and so I think employers got to be thinking about how to, how to drive that. I mean, you, you, you touched on it, which I'm going to ask you about next, but you, you touched on sort of the challenges that, you know, a lot of people are busy, yeah. uh, and struggling, not just to find, uh, raw materials or seeing those costs come up because of supply chain, but struggling to find people to work the machines. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. you know, one of the best ways to uh, solve that problem is to keep the good people that you have. So Correct. what are some of the things that you've seen that they've done that have been effective to keep you engaged or some of the other folks, you know, at the company really engaged? Um, I, I, I think it's just like I said, I think it's that freedom to be to think, you know, on your own and present ideas. Um, it, it's like anything, you know, owners of the company and, and managers and everybody, you know, you have to think outside the box a little bit, mm-hmm. you know, and a perfect example is me being here today. Okay. The owner of the company, I, I mentioned it to him. I said, do you guys, maybe one of you guys want to do this or go? And they're like, Nope, that's you. You, you <laughs> do your thing. You know, that's what, you, so they, they like the fact that now they, they, you know, they have somebody else to be the face of the company, so to speak, and out in the open where they, they're more, you know, Hey, we just want to, Make sure like to work the shop. Good. Yeah, make sure the shop is running good and, and everything like that. You sell the company and let us do what we're doing. So, you know, it, it, how does that make you feel when they're like, "Hey, you go represent us"? I, I like it. I mean, yeah. I'm I'm a pretty outgoing person, and and I I enjoy meeting new people and doing new things, and and I like selling. I like the challenge of it, but I also like the reward of it. And um, you know, I'm I'm a people person to an extent. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, but they like I said, they, they, you know, allow me to do these kind of things and they say, well, why do you want to do that? And it's like, well, Hey, look, I want to talk about the company. I will, you know, and, and let people know about where we are and what our thoughts are in manufacturing, where, what we need, you know, what manufacturing as a whole in the state of Connecticut, we've been working on a lot of things with uh, resource development and the, the mask program and the different schools is to try to introduce the, you know, I don't want to say introduce, but more get manufacturing back out there and, and known. Um, because, you know, I've been doing this for 30 years. I don't plan on retiring anytime soon, but I look at the gap in the, the skill levels of the people coming up. Not so much in my position because, you know, I'm not going to, I'm no genius. Mm-hmm. Anybody could do this if you have a good personality and you're somewhat 
smart anyway. <laughs> and but, driven probably. Yeah, well, yeah. You're going to be too. persistent. You know, you're gonna, yeah, you know, you selling know. yourself a little short, but exactly, go ahead. Exactly, exactly. But, but, you know, as far as the kids, like, do, do you get these stigmas these days about, you know, you know, it's a dirty, noisy, smelly, this and thing. I'm not going to say that it's, you know, it's not, a, a, you're not in a clean room environment all the time, but it's clean. It's not that noisy. It's, you know, and, and what the machines are the ones doing all the work, really. You just got to make sure they do it right. But, um, you know, that's what this whole gap in the manufacturing, to, to getting people to work in manufacturing is there's, there's going to be, it's going to be tough in the future. And I, I would say, you know, if things don't start turning and more people don't get involved in it, they're going to use companies like ours. We're going to have a hard time. Do you see that? Do you see that change? I mean, you referenced mask earlier, yeah. which I really should know what that stands for. Um, but uh, we had I, we had Cindy's old. I'm not 100% sure of the acronym of that, but yeah. yeah, I know Cindy and Mike, and I'm not sure if you know Rich DuPont, but he's gotten, and Salim, there, you know, a lot of people involved in this to, to really start promoting manufacturing. Yeah, and, and just so I, really quickly, just for yeah. anyone that doesn't know, mask is in Waterbury. It's a program. I think Cindy's the executive director or Correct. whatever the, her yeah. exact title is, CEO. Yeah. Um, and it's really all about training to get people ready right. to go into manufacturing. I know they've done a lot of partnerships with manufacturers mm -hmm. to help make custom training programs. They've done some, I don't know if you call it sort of second chance work, but, yep. you know, sort of helping people who maybe, you know, been incarcerated or whatever get, and, but not just that, that's just one yeah. part. And giving people an opportunity to sort of see what the benefits of manufacturing is. Right. It sounds right. like you've been partnering with them. Yeah. Oh, well, I, I don't want to say we're partnering. We, we, I've tried to get involved with it as much as I could. Um, we visited some schools, and, and uh, I visited there recently, uh, and I say recently, a couple months back. And from the time I first visited to the time now, they've made so many advancements and changing changes. They're getting more, a lot more technical with their training and everything like that. So they're building a better program there. They, at first, it didn't seem like it was going to be, you know. When, what you guys needed. Well, yeah, and and and. Even still, with what right 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 now, we're we're not looking for apprentice level people mm -hmm. unless they really have a good drive. Um, but it, it's preparing people for the, for for uh, getting into shops, and that's a start. And you know, unfortunately, we don't have the resources at our shop to to have too many apprentices. We don't have like a training room or anything like that. But some of these bigger companies are doing a great job with um, you know having labs right in their companies to have get them on the machines and everything um and and bring them up um but i i think it's it's there's there's going to be a stigma there's still that stigma and i i blame parents uh, <laughs> why not blame somebody why not blame the parents well do you, i mean do you see it changing you know the, there seems at least from my travels you know which i'm in this a lot obviously um, and there's a lot of programs. I mean, we talked about Mask. I know Goodwin College or Goodwin University. I can't remember. Yeah. You know, they've got some stuff. The community yeah. colleges all over Connecticut. The yeah. tech schools are doing, yeah. you know, are doing a lot. Um, you know, there's a lot of, like, partnerships keep getting announced to try and drive more people into the business. There's, like, you know, down in the eastern part of Connecticut, there's the, you know, the manufacturing uh, pipeline, the MPI. Um, you know, so there's a lot of stuff happening. It yep. seems like it's it's changing. I mean, you know, you can't, hard to turn that on a dime. But uh, but it seems yeah. like it's changing in the right way. They're they're doing a better job, I think, of listening to the people that are out there, manufacturers, mm -hmm. and and understanding their needs and what they're you know what when someone comes in the door, what is going to be the key things that we you're looking for uh, as far as the you know let's say take blueprint reading for instance you know if you are saying okay this is a blueprint this is what the here's a part this is what it looks like but there's so many little details on blueprints these days but like i said with the uh, gdnt and the reading the legends and things like that that they have to enhance and they did they did a great job and they i think they heard people saying that so they they've get done a lot better at that and um but I think that they, you know, listening to the industry and what's going on out there and and what the company would need from students and things like that. And another thing is, you know, bringing it back to the schools. We went to Watertown High School recently. Uh, Rich DuPont had organized a group of people from uh, from Watertown. And there was a couple of us in there that were Watertown High School <laughs> graduates. Um, and 
you know, when I went to high school, the, the back in my day, you know, no, but the shop was, you went through graphic arts, you went through wood shop, you went through metal shop, you went through all these different industrial arts. And, you know, I think it, how it worked, you picked in your senior year or junior year that you, okay, I wanted to stick with metal shop. I want to stick with carpentry. Well, now all they have is metal and carpentry. And I think she said, uh, the principal said there was like 200 students that were applying to get into these programs and they only took 43. Oof. And so they're- the, That's a good sign. Well, it's a good sign, but it's it's not good with, from the schooling standpoint because right. they're, they're, they're funding, of course, it comes down to funding. They didn't, they're taking away certain aspects of it. So mm. it's, it's limiting them. Um, there are, you know, there's still the technical schools, Caner Tech, Bristol Tech, and, you know, I will say, like, Plan. Bristol Tech does a great job. My brother, like, he owns a welding company. He brought kids in there, and my nephew was one of them. He started them out of Bristol Tech, and now he's running the, the shop, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? So it, there's a lot of good a lot of good programs out there, a lot of good schools out there, and, and but they still just got to keep going. Got to keep, gotta keep going, building. Keep yeah, going. the demand is so high. It's got to keep yeah, growing, yeah. no doubt about and, that. Yeah, Absolutely. What do you think is, uh, what do you see as sort of the future uh, for, uh, for Petron? Uh, well, I hope for at least the next 10 years anyway that uh, we continue the, the path we're going. <laughs> uh, but I think that, you know, they definitely have a succession plan. Uh, Mike Sr. is the owner and his, and his wife and Mike Jr. Uh, and his brother are basically going to take over the business. Um, and I think that the, the workforce that we have right there, there right now uh, is in we're, we're in a good zone with uh, ages and things like that. We do have some people that are going to be retiring and we're trying to replace mm -hmm. uh, you know w that with either bringing up young ta you know talent that we have or trying to find people that are out there. Um, so it's it's I think Petron's going to be a long, around a long time. Uh, definitely has a potential to be. Uh, the customers that we deal with are, are some of them are very large companies that aren't going anywhere anytime soon. So, um, I think that the future future is going to be good. I, I, I don't, you know, I can't, don't have a crystal ball with how the business is going to go as far as, you know, what's going on around us in the world. Um, we may see dips, we may see spikes. Uh, I, I would hope that it would stay like it is right now. <laughs> indefinitely. And, and indefinitely, because it would make, uh, it definitely <laughs> would make life a little easier. But like anything else, you're going to have your, you know, yeah. ebbs and flows and, uh, you got to just deal with it when it comes, you know. Listen, uh, you know, small manufacturing certainly alive and well in Connecticut. And, uh, oh, absolutely. we look forward to keeping that going. Uh, listen, Paul, we're going to cut over to a rapid fire round of questions and then wrap it up. You ready? It's not like Jeopardy. No, no, okay. no. There All we right. go. All right. uh, Red Sox or Yankees? Oh, my God. Come on. Yankees. <sighs> A Starbucks or Duncan? Duncan. Staycation or exotic destination? I would say staycation because uh, the last two years, that's all we've been able <laughs> to do. Haven't gone anywhere. Uh, you iPhone or Android? iPhone. Sports car or SUV? SUV. You got a favorite business book? The Goal. The goal. Oh, that's a good one. Yep. Um, if you had to do something other than be the vice president of business development at uh, Petron Automation, it could be anything in the whole world, had to do something else, what would you do? Be a chef. Really? Yep. There you, what kind of food? Any. Any kind of food. Love it. Do you yep. have a favorite business book? The goal. Oh, I said that already. My fault. <laughs> uh, what's something that you learned early in your career, Paul, uh, that you think helped propel you to all the success that you've had? Oh, God, that's a good question. Um, I would say patience. Uh, don't be afraid of failure. You know, make mistakes. Get thick skin, especially in manufacturing. And move on. I will, I will thank a lot of the guys I worked at in the, in the shop uh, when I worked for my brother when I first started. They, they definitely uh, didn't cut me any slack, put me in my place a few times, and my skin grew very thick. It served you well later in life. Yes, it, yes, it has. <laughs> I'm still good friends with a lot of those guys right now. So it's that's uh, great. Yeah, it's, uh, it's funny. And what's something, Paul, that you learned later in your life that if you could go back and tell young Paul, and if he'd listen to you, you think it'd really like, make a positive impact on his life? Yeah. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. I would say uh, save more money, <laughs> do less partying, uh, <laughs> invest well. Uh, and, uh, 
I don't know. I don't, uh, you know. That's a pretty good, those are pretty strong takeaways. Yeah, yeah. And uh, marry your wife. That's what I would say because you know, I got a good wife. So. There you go. <laughs> Paul, thank you so much for coming on today. I really appreciate your time. No problem at all. No problem at all. Thank you. Appreciate it. Made in America with Ari Santiago is brought to you by Compass MSP. Thanks for listening and spending some time with me today. My goal is to help build a strong manufacturing community, and it would be impossible to do without all of you.